All that matters is the work. And for me, every season, and I've been really trying to make this happen, and I think it's been happening, but I don't trust that. But every season, I try to go deeper. I'm like, how can I go deeper with this character? And what does that mean, though? How can I more closely connect to the spirit of Jesus Christ and com- and I think you're communicate d- that to people? I think you're doing it. Like that's like I want people to know that don't know this. Like I'm a I'm a cynical person about this. I think you're doing this. Thank you. God I, willing. <laughs> I, I don't know how though. Like how do what do you mean? What are you um mining out? What what are you excavating to do that? My ego. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Jonathan Rumi is an actor. I sat down with him in Los Angeles, California to talk about the work. Do you have a typical way that you like to begin your preparation process when you get a new role i think for me um obviously it starts with script if it's a script that involves um real people what i might do is just start looking up the person just getting a sense of who they were in real life and then bringing that the concept of of their spirit that energy whatever it is that is interesting about them i start thinking about that and bringing that into the script as i begin to read it Um, with somebody, obviously with like Jesus, for instance, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot of footage on Jesus. So, uh, I have to just, um, I have to kind of refer to my own connection to, to my faith for that with somebody like, uh, Lonnie Frisbee and Jesus revolution. You know, he was an actual guy lived in the sixties and and seventies and beyond, um, our film focuses on this period between late 60s, early 70s. So uh, there's there's footage of him preaching. And then obviously once once I've read the script, once I understand what it's, the needs are, um, if it's a real life person, I will try to to connect with people that, you know, in this case with, I, have, you know, I haven't done a whole lot of biopics where the people are still alive or were recently alive. So, but in, in the case with like Lonnie Frisbee, I got to talk to people that preached with him that knew him that hung mm-hmm. out with him so the short answer is you know I'll, I'll, if if it's somebody that's that there's material on i'll try to like consume that and then have that with me as i read the script through for the first mm-hmm. time if it's completely uh fictional i'll usually read it through once and then i might make like some little scribbles on the mm-hmm. script like exclamation marks or like oh like kind of go back to this because mm-hmm. this is really interesting preliminary thought like markers yeah stuff that hits me whether i'm i'm not sure why mm-hmm. i'll just sort of tab it out and then uh then come back to it in the second reading then i'll probably start making notes mm-hmm. when you first <clears throat> got wind that you might play jesus i'm talking about like before the chosen Mm -hmm. uh uh, that short that dallas uh did was even there was one project even before that Oh, okay so you've played jesus in multiple yeah things yeah three three different directors was that one you're talking about a, a, a stage yeah so i did this i filmed for three days in a studio in washington state for this one woman show about this saint named uh, Saint Faustina Kowalska, she was a Polish nun oh, in the nineteen thirties. Yeah, so uh, yeah, she was a, a a Polish nun in the nineteen thirties. She had all these visions of of Christ, and uh, and she wrote a diary about her experiences in in in, in the Catholic Church. She's considered a, do- a doctor of the faith uh, because of of the the the, um, the complexity and of the theology that she that was given to her and she she had like a something like a third or fifth grade education Mm -hmm. uh poor poor girl growing up um and so there was this one woman show about her and then and the the way that they handled a a full play full of characters for one person show there's this company called saint luke productions they do all these productions about saints 
but it's one person that acts it out and they mm. travel. It's a traveling show. So on the stage or wherever they perform, auditorium, whatever, it'll be the actor, a couple of lighting trees, uh, a couple of basic, simple geometric set pieces, and then a screen. Mm. And on the screen are all the other characters in the play that the person on stage interacts with. So it's all timed out uh, uh, very, very precisely. So in 2013, I got cast to play Jesus for all of the visions that this mm -hmm. saint had of Jesus. Uh, so we, I went up there, filmed for three days, and then that's integrated into the show. Mm -hmm. uh, that this this gal, Maria Vargo is her name, who performed the, the show. Uh, played mm -hmm. her uh, and so she would you know for three or four years she did the show and had all these you know virtual scene partners mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then six months later I got cast in a short film um, for Dallas Jenkins he was doing a film out of his church um, called The Two Thieves uh, and it was about the two thieves that are crucified alongside right. Jesus one on his right one on his left it was sort of like an origin story like a, yeah. a plausible origin story of that and, and that was the first time I met Dallas, who mm -hmm. went on to become the creator of The Chosen. I did mm -hmm. two more films with him over the next four years. And uh, and that sort of, between that, between that first project, and then I was doing these this thing called a passion play, um, you know, which is acting out the uh, crucifixion and death and the moments leading up to Jesus' crucifixion and death. Um, I did that around the same time I was doing these short films. Mm -hmm. So I had a, a pretty good practice run on figuring out how to approach the character, my version of the character of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, when when Dallas said, hey, we're gonna do four episodes of a completely crowdfunded um, streaming television show. And then uh, four episodes became eight episodes. And then now we are, we've just completed season three and uh, we're about to start season four. But when you, when you first, Try to wrap your arms around the idea of playing Jesus. Like mm -hmm. this is not people play characters that were real that have a certain um, weight, but like like Martin Luther King. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. But to play Jesus is not just about thinking about the weight that that has for other people. It's about the weight it has for you because mm. at that time you had a certain relationship with this. Of a person that you're playing mm -hmm. uh, in your mind. Uh, so I want to know your first approaches toward dealing with that within yourself. You know, I think at first, prior to the experience of The Chosen, it was an opportunity for me to connect my art with my personal faith. And that was something that I'd always kind of prayed about, like, secretly, it's like, wouldn't it be cool if I could let somehow find a way to blend the two I had no concept of what that would look like mm. and then when I got this that first Jesus project I was like oh cool well, that's interesting and and I even had a story that was relating to that particular film so there's this meditation called divine mercy like this, this thing that's called a chaplet of divine mercy these prayers you say and it's all about God's mercy which came out of this story of, of this Polish nun. Mm. And I had had a, a, a kind of a miraculous uh, encounter um, with this image that's associated with that meditation mm. in my own life. I have this plaque that was, this, that was that's a representation of this particular meditation, but it's so specific. It's like this Greek Orthodox icon of this Catholic meditation. And I was originally baptized Greek Orthodox, so I... I I'd wanted a, um, I wanted a representation of this meditation, and I thought, you know, I thought to myself, I think I was going through some stuff, and I, and this particular meditation is is really comforting, um, spiritually, and and uh, it's really it's really powerful, and and so I, I th said and and prayed, I'm like, I, you know, it would be, be great if I if I could find a version of this, this image, of in this style of a Greek icon an orthodox icon that was just small enough to fit my little apartment in, in Queens. And three days later, it showed up outside my door. Wow. Just out of nowhere. I've never seen, I never knew that this image existed in this style. Like I just was kind of was being nostalgic about, you know, my, my own sort of 
Greek Orthodox heritage, right? And I thought, man, this is, I, I, I love the idea of this meditation, the artwork that I'd seen associated with this. I wanted something to hang up in my, my mm -hmm. wall so I could just remind me, you know, I'm just like, okay, sort of direct my focus with my prayer. And, uh, and I'd never seen an example of this before. And I just thought it'd be cool if they'd made this image, which I didn't really like, this other kind of traditional image from like 30, 40 years ago. Um, I'm a former illustrator, so I, I'm very particular about images and illustrations. I said, wouldn't it be great if this, if this image, there was like an a orthodox style icon of this that, I, that was just small enough to just hang in my little apartment. And three days later it showed up. And so I told the director of this, when I got to LA and I auditioned for the show, like this is like five, six years, maybe even ten, like, yeah, six, seven years later, I told him this story, which is th th about this play. This, mm -hmm. he's like, uh, he, his, his jaw dropped. He's like, well, obviously, you're the guy that I have to cast you for this. <laughs> I mean, that story alone, you have to be this guy. <laughs> but even then, like, I was like, cool. I love Jesus and I, I love acting and I want to do more of it and I, they would they, they would fly me out I'd never mm -hmm. been flown out for anywhere anything before mm -hmm. so I was a big deal and then I got cast with Dallas and uh, for the you know six months later and it started to get a little more weighty it's st I started to see I think the realization was when I shot this short film the two thieves we shot it in Chicago they cut it within a month and they showed it at their Good Friday service. And it was the first time I'd seen a short film that I'd done with an audience. That so you were there? I was there when we, when we screened it mm -hmm. for the first time on Good Friday. So it's already a, a pretty somber day, a solemn day in, right. in Christian faith. And people were like, like crying and like coming up to me afterwards. And, and uh, it was pretty remarkable. I think that was the first time it dawned on me that, that this might be a bigger calling. This character is not just... A character it's not he's not just a, right. uh, a symbol of my faith that I'm uh, portraying like this might be something else so you were starting to see also what you were doing to people through this I would put it in different terms okay uh, it's interesting talking about this on an acting podcast because it normally I normally wouldn't conflate the two in in in, in uh, this context as a not, you know, if I do a lot of interviews with faith-based media outlets, mm. so I'm used to ha using certain kinds of language, mm -hmm. but I feel myself trying to censor myself and kind of filter myself <laughs> for this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I would say I started to see what God was doing through me playing this character. Uh -huh. Um the minute I start to think that I'm doing anything to anyone, that's right. when this character, it, it, this all of a sudden now it becomes, it, it becomes brought down into, to the ground in a in an in an uncomplimentary way. It's a disservice and a dishonor to the character mm. by saying I'm affecting this because it's not me. So you understood this right away, though. Like this is not something you learned what you just said do you know what i mean it's i started to have it started to to um manifest itself in my mind i'm like wait is this something that is this something that could be that god is going to use me for mm -hmm. to affect people like it wasn't strong in the beginning because i didn't have feedback i didn't people not a whole lot of people saw short films Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, maybe like I, I, to say that I would have met dozens of people between that traveling show um, and the these short films would, would be a lot. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until the first four episodes of The Chosen aired. I mean, even when I performed Passion Plays live, I mean, people would come up to you afterwards, but you sort of, 
you kind of isolate that moment. You're like, okay, this is a performance in a church right. at this time on this day on Good right. Friday. We were performing it on Good Friday, so everybody that's coming here, like they're right. already predisposed right. towards right, right. this feeling, towards the spirituality, towards this openness, to towards this vulnerability, towards the sacrifice of Christ on a cross, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't until the chosen were people I didn't know, people I'd never met, started reaching out to me and and um, sharing with me these deeply personal experiences of how th this show had started to profoundly affect their life and their relationship with their God or introduce them to a relationship with God to show a way to have a personal relationship that they never thought was possible, to mm -hmm. make Jesus Christ and his disciples as relatable to somebody from the 1960s and 70s. Like, I get the sense that I, I, I understand, like, these are not just stained glass icons that were, you know, or, or statues or anything like that, that these were actually real people. And that's been probably the biggest and the most rewarding uh, feedback is because when, when you can relate to a character on screen as an audience member, that elevates the art. That elevates yeah. the impact of that art. Yeah. And and ultimately, I mean, it's, it's a, for for me now, especially like, art is about impact. Um, art can be fun. Art can be purely entertaining, but I get the most satisfaction out of mm -hmm. art when I'm impacted by it, or when I'm when I see people being impacted by the things that I'm associated mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you started to make those four episodes of the chosen what had you learned about playing jesus that you applied to that obviously if we watch those even the shorts or we watch the that film of that theater piece that's a different uh, uh, a version of jesus right it's, it's the, what you the short films it. with dallas were sort of um a, an early blueprint so his writing, for instance, there was there was like the first sort of sense of humor. There was jokes, and so now as we yeah. st as we started to and 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 it, and they worked, and it was like good natured, and people loved it. And they even in the short films, the second year I did a film with them, there was like a Jesus joke, you know. And it was like two disciples are arm wrestling, and one loses, and the other one of them says something, and Jesus says, "Even I didn't see that coming." <laughs> You know, <laughs> which is very funny. People laughed and they're like, oh, it's like Jesus has a sense of humor. What? <laughs> what? It's like, it, well, he, he was a real person. Like mm -hmm. no, no, you know, valid historian uh, um, would, would deny that he actually physically existed. There's right. just too much evidence that he existed. So then to start thinking of him as human right. and now to get to bring that into this portrayal People had never seen that before. Right. Nobody's ever explored this character like this before. Yeah. So as, a, as an actor, this is like, I have a lot of latitude, but with certain boundaries and parameters, mm -hmm. given the theology and given the you know spiritual reverence that, that we have for the character. Yeah. There must have been some kind of balance that needed to, to happen early on with that, right? Because you, you, you want to, you know, you're relishing this in this idea of playing this human, Playing the fullness of humanity right. while maintaining the fullness of his divinity. Right. That's also, though, probably hard to do. Right? I, I guess it's, I want to know, like, tricky. What, what, what did you learn from, from playing him in the, other, in the other projects that you adjusted for this or felt like you had to adjust? I got more zoned in on the accent for instance right which is which was based on family members i'm i'm, I'm middle eastern i'm part middle eastern uh and so the accent is based on it's a middle eastern accent it's based on my my father and my aunt a sort of a combination of the two and so and you relish in the idea of accents like you you've always been oh i love accents yes yeah. You yeah. always love that. They, I, it's not yeah. something you think of as a burden. No, not in the least. It, but does, I, it, does it help? To what? To help you get there. To, for the, to find the character? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Like, because, because I, I've been doing them from the time I was a kid. It's, you know, some people, they, they have an inclination to do accents and other people, they have to, they have to work harder. 
um, I, I was blessed in that it, uh, it accents come fairly easy to me, some more than others. So to me, it's an opportunity to instantly create separation with characters. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for the, when I first played Jesus ever, um, that was a choice that I made that I had never seen him portrayed with an appropriately regional accent mm -hmm. in English. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to use what I think would be appropriate. And if you were, you know, phonetically transliterating Aramaic into English, what could it sound like? And what, where would it, what um, geographical location would it be most uh, akin to mm -hmm. and Middle Eastern, you know? And so my, my aunt's from Palestine, my father's from Egypt. And so I kind of just blended them. And, uh, and that became for the series that became the benchmark that everybody used. So they mm. would send clips of the short films initially oh, wow. before we did the first four episodes of the shows and they would send clips huh. of the short films and tell the actors, this is the, this is the accent we need you to mm -hmm. use. And, um, and it just kind of continued through this the series and yeah. And I think it, it's, it's different. It's unique. Um, one of the directors I worked with, John Irwin, he, he feels like the accent is one of the, the, the innovations of the series just because it, nobody had done it before. Yeah. And so um, I'm kind of proud of that, you know, and I, yeah. I, I work hard on it as well. And, and every season I still have to, you know, run myself ragged, making sure that the muscles I use for that mm -hmm. accent are warmed up properly because mm -hmm. sometimes you have these phrases in English, you're like, that's going to be a mouthful to say with oh, a wow. trilled R, you know? Right. Um, oh, man. How come you don't, I don't remember you ever having a Long Island accent. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I started out. It's the worst accent of all time. <laughs> Thank God you didn't have it. None taken. You just lost half your Long Island audience. Well, I don't think that. The I other half agree with you. Disagree. <laughs> no. It's, uh, some people find it charming. I was just going to so say, it's not charming at all. It's, well, it's charm is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Or in the ear. In the ear. In a way. Knowing you for quite a long time, a couple decades now, and I've seen you on some sets, mm. even directed you on mm. some things, you've always had this, or you seem to have always had this need to get away from people for a little bit, get a little quiet, mm -hmm. even on comedy. Tell me what, what that is about, what that stems from. I'm imagining you need it even more now when you're working on something like this. I'm curious when you say even comedy, are you referring to the project we did together? Yes, or even like uh, Alter Ego. Oh, separating myself for that. Separating myself. Uh, when I myself. was prepping for that. The, no. You were on set on for set. that. You were on set for no, that? No, I wasn't. How do you know then? I know. You're, it was legendary. What? Rumi needs to go get away from everyone. <laughs> was it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I don't even remember that. Um, I'm easily distracted. I think that's what it just comes down to. Most people, most actors that need to distance themselves in general, even if it is comedy. Well, for that guy, I mean, he was a, it was comedy, yes, but you're not dealing with it as like, let's just do some improv. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's a character that has a whole life right. and backstory and a grounding and, and an intention. And, and if there's accents involved, which I think there was on that yeah. short, or there's any kind of drama that's, that's a scene that has to be played straight, right. but it'll read funny. But in the moment, it's like anything Gene it's Wilder focus. did. Yeah, it's all Gene focus. Wilder, you know, I mean, just straight. He was yeah. straight in everything he did. And it was yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Um, but it's about, yeah, it's about focus. It's focus. And I'm, I'm easily distracted and I don't have the, the talent some other actors mm -hmm. have to be able to just turn it on and off mm -hmm. be like mm -hmm. hey so what uh, how was the game last night yeah go, and action so mm -hmm. this is what's gonna happen like i'm i'm not i don't mm -hmm. do that well and especially if there are scenes that have an emotional quality mm -hmm. to them or there's vulnerability or there's you know if there's something deep uh that has to be expressed like i i i get away i i'll listen to music i'll put you know, noise canceling headphones on or, or AirPods or whatever. 
um, just to have as much of that as I can. And then, I mean, being on a set is the most chaotic place to have to work. I mean, if you were, if you were a surgeon on an operating table and you have to do precision work, imagine all of a sudden a construction crew coming in and just putting on like hacksaws and yeah. trying to like r- repair the roof. Right. You're like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like this is this is surgery. This is brain surgery. Yeah. Like I've got a, a millimeter of of room here to put this scalpel, and you've you're you've got like a like a a chainsaw right behind my head. Mm-hmm. That's what it's like sometimes working on a film set when you have a, a, a particularly powerful or or scene where that you need vulnerability, and then you have to stay in that for mm-hmm. sometimes hours and be able to replicate it from four different angles. So now, and it's it took me a long time to give myself and to ask for permission to just say, you know what, I'm going to be in that dark room over there. Mm-hmm. The minute you yell, rolling, you come get me or I'll hear you and I'll walk right out and I'll take my mark and we'll do the scene. Oh, because you need it, it up right up until then. Depending on the scene. That's not all the time. Yeah. There have been times where I'm like, I can't sit here. I can't sit here while they're making an adjustment on this because it's never just 30 seconds. It's never 30 seconds. Yeah. It's yeah. more than that. Or it's a false start or something drops mm-hmm. or all of a sudden the gel falls or, or you know, there's there's something, always something going on mm-hmm. that will want to pull you out of focus. I asked Kelsey Grammer on when we were working on Jesus Revolution. I'm like, how do you do that? Because he could, he's one of those guys that can be do talking that. about something else and just getting right yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah. He'd be just... Just telling a story about you know uh, something that happened on Fraser you know yeah. ten years ago yeah. and everybody's laughing yeah. and then they're like roll sound and all of a sudden he just takes a second he just turns to the side and then all of a sudden his eyes just well up I'm like <laughs> son of a how, and so one time I'm like how do you how do you tune it out yeah how do you tune it all out and he said to me he said I was doing this show one time. And uh, there was this guy that was like the co-lead or whatever. He was on Broadway, I think, or something like that. And he would literally, five minutes before he had to show up on stage, he would be like outside or he'd be like going to get a sandwich or something. And then like literally before his cue, he's just walking into the dressing room, fixing his hair, and then he walks right out on stage and he's in it. And he said he saw that and he's like, I want to do that. Mm. Now he didn't tell me how he learned how to do that. <laughs> he just told the story like, of doing it. You, first. <laughs> well, you little. Um, so I was like, ah, but I, I don't know if there would have even been a story. Yeah. I think after a certain amount of time. Yeah, probably. After a certain amount of life. Yeah. Uh, you start just building up this reservoir of accessibility right. to your emotions. Right. Or this this reservoir of emotion or pain or, you know, joy or something. Or maybe it's having had kids, like right. having seen kids grow up. Like right. there, there's something that maybe just becomes more accessible. Right. There was another, um, Anna Grace Barlow's in the film as well. And she's a, a beautiful, talented young actress. And th- we, there was a joke that like, <laughs> she said somebody, I think, I don't know if somebody... I can't remember the exact details of the story, but somebody got her a T-shirt that that said "Crying is my party trick," and yeah. she's like, "Yeah, I can literally like, do you want a tear streaming down one eye or two eyes?" Wow, that's that's like a that's an unusual gift. Right. There's there's a lot of actors and actresses who can do that. I think more actresses can do that than actors. I think um, I think women are just generally more emotionally available than men, and you know, generally generally speaking, but. uh some people can do that. I, I can't do that. I don't, I'm not that good. So I, I have to work pretty hard or, or be pretty focused or, or pretty isolated mm-hmm. and like stimulated somehow from the outside, mm-hmm. whether it's music I, or, or what. I, I don't Memories. think we should pass judgment on anyone that needs to do that. And, and well, thank you. Even after 
many years, you know, like you're saying, even if you do have life experiences, even if you do have children, even if, and it's still, you still need to go into that dark room. Yeah. You know, like we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, uh, uh no, I I pass no judgment. I, yeah. Obviously, I mean, yeah. no, when I see sad. other people doing it, I'm like, oh, great, I'm not alone. Yeah, and I, it's sad that you would, ha- you know, have to even think like, uh, I hope everyone's going to be okay with this, or yeah, or feel like you uh, a hesitation asking for it. Well, I think that's I think that's the culture of a film set, right? When you're dealing with something that is so enigmatic and so ephemeral and and magical to so many people, like. It's one of the few art forms where you don't know what it looks like to do your art until you're, right. you're done doing it. Right. So if you're a painter, you make a stroke with a brush, you see it. If you're an actor, you make a, a stroke, so to speak, with your face, you don't know what it is because you're inside point. your head. You know, you can't see it unless some, you look at footage. I thought of it that way. You could, you could, if you're a writer, you're seeing the words come up. You're working in a vacuum mm. and you're trusting the people around you mm-hmm. that this is actually usable and it's good. And so there's, there's a huge trust thing. So you're constantly, every job you do, you're like, is this... Is you're never sure, right, right? Right. You don't have proof of what you're doing, other than your previous work. Yeah. But then that's your past work, so you're like, well, this is a new character. So how do I trust that this is good? And then after doing it for long enough, you start to feel like, okay, I this is fine. Right. And I had this feeling of doubt before, and it worked out. That's right. Yeah. It gets easier, but there's still by by nature of of the process. It's still always disconcerting. Yeah. And that's what few others understand unless they've actually done it. Mm-hmm. And so when they see an actor asking for feedback or something, everybody's quick to just say, well, insecure. Well, you do this and you tell me how you feel when you don't know what, what it looks like, what you're doing. Like I worked as a grip. Mm-hmm. I've worked in a number of production jobs. I was in production years before I became mm-hmm. a professional actor. Mm-hmm. So I got a taste of everything. If I'm putting up, if I'm setting up a C stand, and I'm putting, you know, putting up a, 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 you know, a flag or something like that for, you know, which is to to, to shape light on a film set, um, I know what it looks like. I know how the 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 head works, the locking yeah. mechanisms work. Yeah. So I know I have to use a certain amount of strength, and that that's not going to ch- like it's there, and I know I can do that thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And once it's done, I don't have to think about it again. As an actor, you don't have that kind of tangible uh, outcomes to just say, okay, there, this is the exact thing that, the, the exact angle that this needs to be in order to get this job done. You're, right. you're just sort of trying things and you're trusting somebody else's opinion that you tried yeah. enough to accomplish the scene. And then sometimes you'll see it and you'll be like, why did they use that take? Yeah. Like that was my worst take. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then, then you're, 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 um, the subjectivity of, 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 or the objectivity rather, of that person's opinion then comes into question. Right. And you're like, okay, do I trust them to work with them again? Mm-hmm. What am I going to, you know, do I have mm-hmm. to be more vocal the next time we, if we ever do this again together? Right. You know, or for the next director I work with, you know, do I need right. to outline certain things or is, are they going to interpret that as me being like bossy or just uh, you know a diva or or whatever or whatever labels? Because it, it's 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 just so uh, ambiguous as an art form in a way mm-hmm. when it comes to like how do we control this? Mm-hmm. And and uh, and at the end of the day, you just got to say screw it. I I don't care what people think. Yeah, yeah. I know that what I'm going to commit to the level of feedback uh, and and a commitment I need from my colleagues whether they're scene partners or directors i know i trust what i need from them and i and i'm at this point confident enough to ask them for what i need and it might be maybe uncomfortable at times for some people but it's never going to be disrespectful or dishonoring to them but i know that even if it's uncomfortable or if they're like oh you want another take trust me i have i have an idea mm-hmm. let me do the idea and then when it's done inevitably it's like yeah that was great that yeah. was great so it's like you, you trust me i'll give you what you need and and then some mm-hmm. and because otherwise that when you don't when you don't take that chance when you uh, you, you end up c- 
kicking yourself and then it, it you know you're like why didn't i just say something why didn't i just say something right. you know and you look at most every other department people don't have a problem telling what they need every other department yeah they're like no this is what i need and everyone wants to get them what they need yeah and it's like i'm not asking you for more money you know usually another right. department well i need a jib we don't have the money for a jib <laughs> we'll do it another way i'm not asking for anything that costs anything else other right. than time and time can be time, time is, can cost is it can be costly reasonably but it's you know unless i'm holding up a a, um, a shot for 15 takes mm -hmm. you know if it's another take if it's more complicated if there are like you know f firearms pyrotechnics or something that's that's one thing but if it's just like you know what I, there's an, another color here that i want to explore mm -hmm. i think it might be interesting mm -hmm. and sometimes they end up going with that i wonder how much of this though is also you being a filmmaker before you were an actor in a way you know what i mean like oh yeah and and like you're saying even even being a a a, a person on a set a lot you you kind of are, are bringing that into your acting like you know you have an idea of what will work more than maybe somebody who doesn't have the experience right well i think i you know because i i i like to write or rather i like to rewrite i think i'm i'm good at rewriting um or editing uh i think like an editor i think like a writer and so sometimes you know i i'll i'll ask i have i'm very very fortunate to have the relationship i do for instance with with dallas jenkins on the chosen where you know this the scripts are fantastic scripts are, are beautiful some of the most beautiful scripts i've ever read um but sometimes some of the stuff just just doesn't work in the mouth when you're saying it out loud mm -hmm. and they they all get that and i i'm fortunate that i'm in a position now where they completely trust me. Mm. And if I'm like, I can't say this like this. Like, can we say this another way? Can I do some, what if I just did this instead of saying that? Mm. They'll be like, that's great. That's great. And and so I'll try stuff and they give me the latitude because they know I'm not going to suggest something that's going to be stupid or, or just working against the plot or, or costing them more money or, you know. At the end of the day, I want, we all want this to be the best it can possibly be. And if I, if I have an opportunity to, to help something be better, I have to I have to express it. Because if I don't, then and and then and then it let's say there's there's something that isn't better that could have been better, and I didn't say anything because I was afraid to, or I feel I didn't have the, the the relationship. Then you know, then I I will then regret my involvement in that yeah. thing that I could have helped make better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my ideas won't be better and we'll try something and it doesn't work. And I'm like, okay, well, thank you for letting me try it. I'm grateful for letting me try. Mm -hmm. And you have to be, actors also have to remember to be grateful to the people they're working with. I feel like there are these, there is often an imbalance in perceptions about, you know, what an actor needs versus what he should be given or what he should get. But at the same time, the actors also can feel like they're entitled yeah. and and they get a bad rap because of that and yeah. bad behavior you know whatever so there's no there's no talent i have no tolerance for that i have no there's no room for that if you you know when when you're on a professional set and i think when you do get the opportunity to do another take to try something different you should be grateful yeah you should be grateful that that this director and this entire crew took another five minutes which cost thousands and thousands of dollars to allow you to experiment I have an allergy to most Christian, quote unquote, Christian content, and <laughs> and my my allergy doesn't get triggered as often with the chosen, mm. and that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, and compound that with me knowing your work very intimately for many years, mm -hmm. and still getting affected by it in a uh, in a in a pure way is even more miraculous, I think. Mm. Three scenes I want to talk about quickly, maybe. Mm. Um, there's something there that you're working with that affected me, and I know it affected pe pe a, a lot of people watching. I want to know what you were working with there. Mm. Uh, the first one was in episode one, at the end, with you and Liz Tavish. Mm -hmm. uh, she plays Mary Magdalene, and 
at the end is very incredibly powerful moment mm. there uh tell me about filming that is this just movie magic that is part of it is this something that no. you were doing there is there something that you were working in with her um yeah so n no i i i i don't i don't think it's movie magic at all um that scene is is one of the most special scenes in the entire series uh and 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 still so uh it's been so it's been profoundly impactful for thousands of thousands of people that have written to us uh thousands of women especially have have like that scene is is like a turning point in their spiritual lives in their personal lives um because of the circumstances um without giving every, anything away like you know uh specifically you know mary magdalene is in a pretty rough place in her life and she ends up in a bar um not for the first time but um at, at a pivotal moment where we don't know what's going to happen to her and then jesus walks up to her and she basically runs out of the bar and he calls her he calls to her and in that moment everything changes and her life changes in that moment and the preparation of that moment as actors and director um dallas talks about this scene as well for his own prep i mean when we were filming that moment uh we all knew the weight of this moment I don't think we knew just how deeply it was going to affect people, but we knew that this was a special scene. And so I'm off in my corner crying, doing my thing. She's off in her corner crying, doing her thing. You're talking about before action. Before we actually called action. Dallas, he's kind of tearing up, kind of doing his thing, watching us prepare and watching us rehearse. And... um and then the language that's used, it's its out of scripture. Uh, so for us, for us who were a part of that moment, um, the movie magic for us is a spiritual encounter that, that, that happens as a result of watching this. And I believe like as humans, the spirits within us sense ultimate truth profound truth the spirit knows truth when it sees it and when it witnesses that truth it is irrevocably changed by the truth you cannot deny the truth people say my truth your truth i'm talking divine truth when you witness divine truth your spirit has to acknowledge it in some way and the reactions in everybody could be slightly different but for most people it's this profound emotional response. And so when we actually got to it and we shot it, I mean, that's what happens for us e even in the scene, mm. you know? What people witness mm. watching the scene is what happens to us filming the scene. Wow. And then when we cut, it, it takes a few minutes to come out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I, I, I need a minute. Some scenes are like that. That was one of them. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, part of the way we sustain ourselves financially is through selling like merchandise. And there's this artist, uh, this famous regional artist in Utah, Liz Lemon Swindle, who painted a depiction of that moment that, like, it's just, she donated the painting. I mean, this lady that gets $100,000 for a painting. And she just paints scenes from The Chosen. And, and like just because she's so moved by it and she gave us a painting of that moment of this embrace mm -hmm. that that uh, now like we, we sell so many of these paintings it helps fund the show mm -hmm. um, and people just love that moment because it is just so powerful so I, I think it's just a recognition of this divine truth maybe my favorite scene in season one is the woman at the well mm. talking about Vanessa De Silvo, mm -hmm. talk to me about this scene. You're seeing that coming up on the schedule. Mm -hmm. 
you're probably thinking you need a couple days to prepare for this. Am I right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Easily. Is this something you wanted to prep with her? Are you prepping by yourself? I'm trying to remember. I don't know if I was able to prep with her. I you think. You would have wanted to? I think, I mean, by prep, I don't even mean necessarily run the scene. Yeah. What I mean, just, mean? just to talk to her, just to get a sense of how she's going to she is. It. I don't think we had the opportunity to connect ahead of time. And so it might have been just on set. And because of how that scene plays out from the beginning. It works with it, right? It works. It, it was fine. Because you need, you don't know her. Correct. You have no prior. Correct. Your character knows yes. her. Yeah. So you. <laughs> so yeah. So there, there's that kind of uh, duality there. That's That can work on your mind quite a bit. That, that whole. <laughs> Meeting this person for the first time, how but much, not really. How much do I know her? I helped create her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I was excited to do that scene because it's such a, a meaty scene. And uh, well, this these, is the these first. Thing. Yeah. That, that's a good point. I mean, like here you are with enough space, finally, mm -hmm. just two people, yeah, and enough time to like. It's like actually, an eight-minute scene or something. Right. A ten it's almost scene. like um, you can you can when you say meat, that's what you mean, right? Meaty yeah, yeah. time, meaty acting time. Meaty meaning juicy, yeah, like yeah, juicy scene. So a lot to there's a lot that happens. Yeah. There's you go on a journey in that one scene. Right. right you start right. one place, you end in a different place. Right. Uh, those are the ultimate scenes. Robert McKee, you know, the story seminar sure. guru, um, the screen uh, script doctor guru, basically talks about. And, and as an actor, that I, I I took his story seminar in New York for three mm. days, and as an actor, I wanted to be a better actor to understand how writers crafted scenes. Interesting. What made a good scene. Right. I recommend anybody that hasn't either read the book or taken his seminar to take his seminar on story because then you bring that knowledge into your auditions because mm. not every scene is written the way it should be to make a great scene. Right. So what can you do as an actor to now make sure that the scene turns, the character starts one way and ends somewhere else? And even if that's not on the page, but you figure out a way to make that work in the context of an audition, mm -hmm. people will be affected by that right. and be like, what? That guy was great. Like, I don't know why he was different from somebody else, but right. his choices reflected this journey in this one scene. Right. And that's what this scene had built into it. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautifully written scene about this woman who's resistant, who's closed off, who's guarded. And then she, it's really her scene. She is completely changed by the end of the scene. And my um my approach it's like i have to facilitate that change within her right. so it's kind of starting at her level of guardedness and then the revelation of who i am to her which changes her forever and uh these two scenes that you've mentioned have been for season one especially my two favorite scenes like there, some people ask me the first two scenes i think of are episode one and episode eight mm -hmm. the woman at the well and she was just a joy to work with and like being able to work off of her. I mean, I did my own kind of prep and even on set, I'm listening to music. I'm, I'm looking at pictures, I'm doing whatever. And then, and then it's like that goes away mm -hmm. and I just work off of what's in front of me. And um, I think the value of having tools as an actor um, is when you get to a scene whether it's not in the scene, it's not on the page, or it's not in your scene partner, you've got to find a way to make the scene work. And that's when you dig into your tool belt. But hopefully, you're having an encounter with a person. You're, you're living an experience with a person, and the reactions and responses take care of themselves. Right. And that was what it was with her. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I might have had, you know, I might have like, got the motor going mm -hmm. and then once we were dialed in like we were just shifting gears and going all over the map mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was effortless it was effortless mm -hmm. and then she runs it. she runs off at the end yeah i, I mean every time i talk about this scene it, it actually gets me emotional just even thinking about it she runs off with just this profound joy and and spirit and like this liberation this freedom mm -hmm. in her heart that i just it just made me just tears just stream down my face and mm -hmm. i'm like i wasn't planning on doing that yeah but i couldn't help it yeah because of the change that was clearly evident in her yeah
but she's an actress. She's yeah. acting it. Yeah. But but in the moment, we're just, it's what you hope for. It's what you hope for in a scene partner. Like we just let's just live in this moment, right. and somebody happens to get it on film. It's it's almost unfair that that you have moments like that right where that happens and then times when you have to really struggle to create yeah. something yeah and, right <laughs> yeah i mean that's i mean that's the uh, shame of this but that's the way it is and it yeah. could just be that people are just stuck and it could or it could be you that are stuck in a um i've been stuck plenty of times right where it just there's just not an energy going or something yeah and you have to create or, it i mean i think I think that's why chemistry reads are so important. Mm. I, and I don't think that's just, you know, men and women who are, you know, supposed to be partnering, like uh, presenting or portraying a relationship in a movie or a TV show. I think that should be anybody that has meaningful scenes together. Like if I, if, you know, if, if Jesus has a scene with King Herod, I'm just making this up. This isn't a, a, a storyline that I know of at this point. If let's say Jesus and King Herod have this, 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 they get into it in this scene um, which is would be outside of scripture, obviously, um, to a point. Like, depend in my mind, like I'm imagining a scene where there could be this like elaboration of this encounter between like Jesus and King Herod, who was like one of the bad guys at the time, and uh, like when they're casting King Herod as an actor, like I want to be in the room mm. with their selections. Mm -hmm. Let's see, like who works well together. And who like because it's like it's like dating, you know. You right. want there to be a spark, right? And so if it's me, like whenever possible. And and when we did certain casting early on, like uh, because we have an international cast and we don't have a budget, you know, we're we're we were crowd, we're crowdfunded and fan supported now. Like we just we we couldn't do that. Yeah. We weren't able to do that. Um, but I mean, we were saved by these miraculous choices that, you know, Dallas has got a great eye for talent. Mm -hmm. We're very, very fortunate to have wrangled the cast that we have had, especially on our budget. But, you know, would I like to be in the room for the next several seasons for, for some of the big characters that I may be having conversations with? Sure, yeah. sure. You know, especially if they're new, um, because I, I think it I think it can have a, a huge impact on how the story is received mm -hmm. when two actors are, you know, whether it's good versus bad, light versus dark, you know, good versus evil, um, there, there, there's a chemistry there. There's a film chemistry or TV chemistry that I think um, it, it, it helps the narrative exponentially. Mm -hmm. Last one is from this past season. Jordan Ross. That's he, he talk about that a scene, scene that people are really uh, moved by. It's going viral. That scene. That. Uh, Right. For those who haven't seen the show, Jordan Ross plays a character named Little James, who in real life has uh, cerebral palsy and, and scoliosis. And there's a scene where he, and he has a, a visible limp in the show. Yes. And when he got cast, that wasn't quite obvious. In fact, he had tried to hide wow. the limp to an extent. And then it became evident to Dallas that like, oh, he has a limp. And I think the story goes, Jordan's like, oh, here we go. Because he's been... He's been cut from cast before. Wow. He's been recast, I think, because of that. And so when Dallas saw it, he's like, huh. And then it got him thinking. He's like, can can we use, are you okay if we use that in wow. the show? Wow. And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> and it just, it was, I mean, it changed everything for him. And so in the show, he has a limp when he walks and Jesus is sending out the disciples two by two, there's 12 of them, to go do many of the miracles that he does, which includes healing the sick, healing people that are that are you know handicapped or with, with um, ailments or, or, or diseases, and so after he sends them out, little James comes to Jesus and just says, "Master, you're sending me out with these powers to heal these people," and Jesus is like, "Yeah," and he's like, "But, but you haven't healed me." Why haven't you healed me? And that scene, like especially for people who have disabilities, has been profoundly 
insightful and encouraging and uplifting because of Jesus' answer, yeah. which I won't tell you here. You'd have to go yeah. see it or watch it on the app. And that was another scene where, like, that's one of my favorite scenes of season three. Uh, I mean, I didn't have to act with Jordan. Mm -hmm. I just had to look at him and hear him saying these words that he himself has right. said in his own heart. Right. Like, God, why would, you know... Right. Why would you allow this for me and not other people? And he's he's in such a great place with it. In fact, he's 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 hey now has a, a podcast called Yeah What's, What's Your, Your limp? limp, and he talks to people. And a limp doesn't necessarily need need to be limited to a physical Everybody limp. Everybody has a limp, some some kind of limp. We ask these questions of God, of the Creator, of the universe, of intelligent, whatever you want to, however you want to frame it. We have these questions. We're desperately searching for meaning and for purpose. And so we have these questions that we ask ourselves and we have these struggles that we experience ourselves. And so when we see them played out in front of us by people who can relate to these scenes in some way, there is this undeniable authenticity in the scenes that you can't fake. If we had an actor playing a guy with a limp, this scene wouldn't have worked in the same way. This scene actually probably wouldn't have even come up. Right. Wouldn't have come up. Right. So throughout the history of this series, there has been this guiding hand. I mean, for me, it's God's been guiding this series with these moments that have affected people on levels that they weren't anticipating. I met a girl a couple of years ago and I found out that a year prior, she was like 19 at the time, she was in such a bad state of depression that she had decided she was going to take her own life. And how she was going to do that is she was going to hang herself with a jump rope in her parents' home. And she had written out a note and was going to leave the note for them to find. And before she carried it out, she got a call or something from a friend of hers. And they talked and her friend said, don't, don't do anything. Just hold on. Just, just pause that for a moment. Just come over. Let's just, let's just watch TV. Let's just chat. Just don't do anything. So she went over. They hung out. And this girl puts on episode one of The Chosen. And she gets to that last scene that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Which isn't a far state of mind from where the character was. Mm -hmm. And she just burst into tears. And recognized, like Jesus with Mary Magdalene in that scene, that this girl's life meant something. That she had a purpose for being here. That she had an identity in God. And it so profoundly impacted her, she, she decided not to carry out her, her own wow. suicide. Wow. And a year later, we're sitting in a circle talking about this story and this impact on this family. And we're all crying. Mm. And then last summer, I got an update to see how she was doing. And she's now helping troubled young women herself, working Amazing. in, I think, a clinic, girls with depression. Amazing. And just helping them get out of their, their state and... It's like, I mean, it's one life is worth the entire right. series. That's right. It's That's been right. all seven seasons. You know what I mean? Right. So I think when you have actors that have suffered, humans that have suffered in these roles that are revealing these profound truths and, and how God can impact people, I think God is hardwired into our DNA. There's this search for God. It's within our DNA from the beginning of time. And over the course of time, it's like, well, how have we tried to replace that search for God? What have, we re what have we replaced God with in our lives? What is the thing that you worship? Is it celebrity? Mm -hmm. Is it money? Is it uh, prestige? Is it, uh, you know, notoriety? As an actor, I had to ask myself, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. What am I trying to prove? What do I need from this? And I guess in some way for me it was... I needed to be good at something. I needed to prove that I could do something. But it wasn't the end of it. I, 
I felt that this is where I was directed, that I was led here for some reason. I had this desire and I was given these gifts to do these things. But for many years, it was really, really hard. I struggled when I got out here. I've been doing this almost 25 years now. When I basically got to a point in my life where I was on the border of poverty and in debt and all this other stuff, and I was out, literally out of food, I had enough food for the day. It was at that point I got on my knees and stared up at my, my crucifix in my living room, and I just was like, you know what? I, I can't do this on my own, God. I surrender. Like, whatever you, if you want to take me out of the business, that's fine. Whatever you want, because I can't, I can't do this on my own anymore. I've tried, but I trust you, and I take you at your word. And Jesus said, to you, "You know, come to me, all who are weary and and and, and burdened, and I'll give you rest, because my my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So, give me your troubles, because I can shoulder them when you can't." And I said, "Okay, you got it." And I'd never really said that before with any conviction. Mm. But now I was forced into the position. I had no choice. And that day, I mean, I was, I was overdraft 80 bucks. I had $20 in my pocket. I was thousands of dollars in debt. I hadn't worked side, I hadn't worked a catering job in weeks. I had no idea how I was going to pay my rent. And I don't, I, I would have run, I would have run out of food that night. No idea how I was, I was going to eat the next day. But I let it go. I, I, I completely surrendered it completely to God. And I just said, listen, it's your problem now, man. And whatever happens, happens. And I trust you. And the minute I did that, it was like this weight just came right off of me. And it was like, God's like, yes, now you get it. Now you get it. And so I went. I probably spent my last 20 bucks on a good breakfast. I, I came back home. And there were four checks in my mail. Like four of them. Wow. One I was expecting for fifty bucks, which was like a reimbursement from the one of the passion plays. I'd bought some some props or something. Then the other three, I'm like, what is this? And I was so dumbfounded to see four checks. I said, I gotta I gotta document this somehow. And I put I set up my phone on my bed as I opened the checks. And each check was bigger than the last one. Mm. And I was just, I was just beside myself. I was overwhelmed with emotion. They were like residual checks that hadn't paid out in like years. One wow. of them. And I ended up that day. I had eleven $1 hundred dollars at the end of the day. <laughs> eleven $1 hundred dollars. A week later, I received another check. I think it was like a residual check, from that was equal to the first four. Wow. Okay, I get it. Complete utter surrender. Done. Three months later, I, I booked The Chosen, and my, my life has never been the same. Wow. So I, I owe everything that I have right now is, is through, by the grace of God. And uh, I had a lesson to learn in that moment and uh, in my life, and it changed me forever. And I think these scenes all have some sort of nugget of that kind of a profundity mm -hmm. that people recognize. And the actors that are playing these parts, I mean... I won't give any specifics, but if you go into everyone's personal lives and talk to them about what resonates with their roles, everybody's got something like, I can't believe I got this role. Wow. Like, this was me. Like, that was me in that thing. This was me in this time. And I was about to, so many of the actors on the show, like, they were literally like, well, guess I'm never acting again. Liz has talked about this publicly, so I don't think I'm I'm oversharing, but like she had given up acting and her agent submitted her without her knowing for this role. Wow. And she would, you know, when she got the script, she's like, I have to do this. I have to do this. So this, this series is bigger than most of our careers and it will define our careers, I would say, for a very long time. And I think most of us are okay with that. I certainly am. As these seasons go on and you realize how much your portrayal is impacting people, does this make it easier to go to day one of the next season each time or more burdensome? Dallas has a great quote. 
about this process when he's writing every subsequent season, when he sits down for the first time to his computer. He says, the blank screen doesn't care what you did last season. The blank page doesn't care what you did last season. So I have to approach it the same way. Doesn't matter what I did or what I didn't do, what I accomplished or how well it was received. It doesn't matter. All that matters is the work. And for me, every season, and I've been really trying to make this happen, and I think it's been happening, but I don't trust that. But every season, I try to go deeper. I'm like, how can I go deeper with this character? And what does that mean, though? How can I more closely connect to the spirit of Jesus Christ and com- and I think you're communicate do- that to people? I think you're doing it. Like, that's like... I want people to know that don't know this. Like I'm a I'm a cynical person about this. I think you're doing this. Thank you. God I, willing. <laughs> I, I don't know how though. Like how do what do you mean? What are you um mining out? What what are you excavating to do that? My ego. What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? <laughs> uh, you leave your pride and your ego at the door. You leave yourself behind and put others in front of you. You care more about others receiving the accolades than yourself. That's what it means. And as an actor, I have to care about the people that I work with more than myself. I have to want them to do better in the scenes than myself. And when I can do that, and when I can communicate that and transmit that through the lines on the page of dialogue, that's when something else works through me. We would say that's when the Holy Spirit, when you get out of the way, the Holy Spirit has room to work through you to be received by the people watching the scene. Then they're watching the scene and they don't understand what they're seeing. Mm-hmm. And they're experiencing things and they're having they're having a reaction to these characters that they never heard of, that they never grew up with, that was a different faith than theirs. Jesus has to bring with him this infinite love and compassion wherever he goes and whomever he meets. And so that has to be present in me somehow. And in order to make that real, I have to get rid of self. I have to destroy ego. I still may need things on set, Mm -hmm. but my heart has to be centered on his heart. It's like any other character. When you're preparing... There has to be something about them that you can connect to or identify with in order for that portrayal to appear truthful and organic. And if there's not, you see the person acting. Mm -hmm. So when you're approaching a character like Jesus, what does that mean? Well, that means you better be living your life in a righteous way. You better be trying to walk the walk. Mm -hmm. Because if I was being a less than savory person in my personal life, if I was you know, operating out of the gutter of humanity and treating people awfully and then trying to play this character, it would nobody, nobody would buy it in a minute because mm. there's no truth. There's no heart to it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm the antithesis of what he was. Mm-hmm. So it's anathema to try to portray him mm-hmm. if I'm not living true to, to the example he's setting as a human being. So for me, you know, When I talk at some of these places I get called to speak, like, I'm like, look, I'm I'm the biggest sinner of all, you know, and people have a hard time, especially in in society with the word sin, sin. I mean, it's a whole other conversation. Like, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a separation from you and God. That's all it is. It's like, how have you separated yourself from your creator in a way that he wants you back in, in relationship? And to do that, you've got to change some things about your life. 
And so my life has literally changed how I live it in the last five years since I had my, my sort of deeper encounter. I don't live the same way. And we've talked about this, you know, off, off record. Like I live completely differently than I used to. Mm-hmm. And I'm, great, I'm a greater person for it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's only because of that. Before I got the show, it's only because of that profound spiritual change in my personal life that I'm able to to step into this role and anybody have any kind of positive reaction from it or encounter with it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the only way that this resonates is because I've done the work on myself to try to honor this character in a way that people feel like what they're seeing. So many, I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre, but I say this to illustrate a point. I can't tell you how many people say, this is what I picture Jesus to be like in in my own mind, like like what what I'm seeing. It's like I feel like he's on the screen. Mm-hmm. I say praise God. I I can't take credit for that. All I can do is get out of the way and allow the Spirit to operate with the things that He professed and taught and the example that He set. And I hope to continue it for four more seasons, four through seven. Let's talk about Jesus' revolution. Let's do it. Lonnie Frisbee, mm. like you mentioned earlier, real person. Yep. Lived. He unfortunately died at a pretty young age. Uh, so you can you couldn't talk to him. No, I couldn't talk to him. Talk to personally. people that 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 knew him, like you mentioned. I I want to know really like what I was impressed by by this. I, mean, I was impressed by this movie. I was impressed by your performance, your characterization. I was impressed that you didn't let the, you know the word hippie kind of dictate this, caricaturize this. Mm. Was that a conscious effort? I think in in that sense of the word, when people hear the word hippie, they think of what a hippie wears, right? And they think of a dude that just flashes a peace sign everywhere. Um, I think those might have been side effects of the culture of the time. But it's not the thing that made this guy who, who he was. You know, he was a product of his age, obviously of his generation. But what fueled him and what fueled my approach to playing him was this uh, conviction, uh, was this spirit within him. Um, physically speaking, he was a, a, a very uh, small man in stature. He was, I think, like five foot two, something like oh. that, around there. People, I've heard ranges from what his actual height. I, I don't recall him uh, di- di- divulging his actual height in in his autobiography, but uh, I'm told he was very, very petite. He was uh, like, and like he weighed under a hundred pounds, and like he had like a size seven shoe or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm I'm six feet tall and 170 pounds. Uh, I mean, when I started, I was about 175 pounds before I started the, you know, uh, training for the film. And, um, my goal was to drop 20 pounds and, uh, at least for myself, you know, I can't chop off 10 inches of my height, obviously, but for myself, I wanted to feel thinner. I wanted to feel skinnier, smaller, know what that's like. So that starts to affect me psychologically. And then his voice was kind of up here. It's a little, since he was a smaller guy, he had a higher register than I normally have. So I kind of tried to find where organically this pitched up kind of makes sense to where I could hold on to it for long enough Mm -hmm. and then just try to, you know, uh, make sure I got the vocalizations as close to there's recordings Possible. of him. Yeah, there's recordings of him preaching. There's recording. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff with him mm. preaching. Uh, there's a documentary on him. Um, that's that's kind of like a little rough, but uh, it was really helpful. And then, um, you know, I talked to the the co-author of his book, uh, Roger Sachs, uh. and that the, the 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 first in a trilogy of books called the Jesus Revolution, with Lonnie and and Roger, and uh. so. Um, getting to talk to Roger, who spent three years with Lonnie towards the end of his life, oh. uh, and who came to Christ because of Lonnie, um, 
you know, I, I, I had access to stuff that you can't find on the, on, on the internet. And then talking to him and, and Pastor Ken Gullickson, former Pastor Ken Gullickson, I don't think, he, I think he's a retired pastor now, um, who, who was, you know, like a teenager, early 20s, around the same time Lonnie was, and getting to talk to these guys in person and, and wanting to, um, to make sure I did him justice and, and honor him uh, was, uh, was really important. Um, and that, to me, um, it, you know, it was this, the spirit of what he was doing. Um, I think because it, it's counterculture, I mean, that, that to me is the hippie. That's what the hippie is about. Um, you know, yeah, flower child, flower power. Sure. They're, they're, you know, those are, those are the ornaments of hippiedom, but, uh, they're not the, the central thrust of the movement. You and I were in an Uber the other day. Hmm. You were talking very, uh, generously to the, uh, driver and I'm, i mean generously sometimes people don't talk to drivers i imagine I'm, I'm not in a lot of ubers but you were asking him a lot of questions mm -hmm. about himself in a very nice way in a way that made me feel like i don't have i was kind of zoning out you, you were kind of taking <laughs> care of things uh very nice guy uh, but uh then he asked you what do you do and there was a hesitation i would call it mm -hmm. you may have even sighed before you answered and you said, I'm an actor. And uh, I wanna know what that hesitation was. Mm -hmm. And then I have a follow-up question. Okay. So th th there, there definitely was a hesitation, but once upon a time that he hesitation would have been for different reasons. Interesting. Five, let's, let's six years ago. Talk about that. Five, five six, six years ago, that hesitation would have been a sigh of, uh, do I want to out myself as an actor in Los Angeles, struggling to work? Mm. In other words, Diamond Dozen. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Yeah. Move on. Uh, embarrassment, a little bit of shame. Now, that hesitation is, what are the ramifications if he knows the show? Do I want to out myself for the show that some people, they, you know, when they hear it, they flip out. So it was like, do I tell them? But in that split second decision, I kind of checked my gut and, you know, I checked the spirit and be like, it's okay. I'm like, okay, I'll, t I'll say I'm an actor. Uh, what does it feel like to not have much time between that first reason going away? In other words, you went from struggling you, like you call it a little shame of calling yourself an actor in this mm -hmm. town to actually being worried about fans yeah. at, you know outing yourself as you know and being having to deal with a celebrity uh, a, pro a problem yeah very you know i mean there's not much there wasn't much <laughs> time between there at the end of it all i can only be grateful but nobody gives you a, a manual on celebrity and how to do it you're you're always left to figure it out on your own i found like every step of this process as things have expanded incrementally um i've tried to reach out for to people or to try to find you know some sort of mentor you know um to kind of guide me through it and i've had specific people that i think could relate in ways you know at the level that i'm at currently and i haven't really been successful for a number of reasons not blaming anyone i just just circumstance but i think i'm also meant to i think i'm meant to learn this on my for myself i'm, I'm meant to figure it out on my own there's no rhyme or reason why i should be successful at this point yeah i've been i've been plugging away for 25 years now and it was 20 years before I booked this series. But there's no reason why it should have gone or why it should have went or why I should have been cast and not somebody else. Uh, the only explanation is grace. It's the only thing. I mean, it sounds trite or cliche or, you know, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's true. I mean, this, for me, it's been, it's been made very clear to me that this, for at this point in my life, this is my, my mission. This becomes sort of a ministry for me in, in engaging in 
uh, my fellow humans in a way that can hopefully uh, help people in some in some way. I have to accept every bit of it, you know, and be grateful for it because I don't have to worry about what I'm going to eat tomorrow now. Um, I can pay my bills. I can take care of my family at, at Christmas uh, in a way that I always had wanted to, but couldn't for many, many years. So anytime I struggle with, with the idea or, or struggle with being recognized and, and people wanting to talk to you and people projecting, you know, the idea of, of Jesus onto you and or in some way maybe thinking like by meeting you, they can get some kind of healing and, and it may it may be true. Um, but having those encounters or having those expectations, when you have those encounters, you feel that. And when it happens so successively, it, it it's it's a lot to deal with it's it's tiring it's emotionally uh exhausting in a way that um i never thought it could be because it's not just somebody saying i love your movie it's somebody relating the some of the 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 deepest parts of their life with you and i have to honor that and i and i don't shy away from that but but it is exhausting that's part of the part of the territory you know it it's, comes with the territory and it's part of doing what I do for a living. So if ever I'm feeling like I'm tired or I'm exhausted or I, I, I try to remember to just offer it back up, you know, to the, the guy that I'm portraying because of what he went through for humanity. The least I can do is take some pictures and sign some autographs and make a few people smile and maybe give them some hope or an encouragement or, or a word or two, you know. Jonathan Rumi. I've known you longer and I know you better than anybody that's been on this podcast, but it took five years and 239 episodes for you to come on mm. and to be asked, you mean to, to be, be, a, to, to be, be asked. asked, to be asked to come on. And I, I want you to come on when I would have had you on if I didn't know you. Mm. I'm really grateful and I'm glad it happened this way. I'm glad we didn't do it any other way. It wasn't forced. It happened when it was meant to happen. The amazing thing is that I'm actually inspired by your work. Thank you. It's not, I'm not just proud of you mm. as a friend. I'm actually inspired by your work. That's huge. Thank you, man. That means the world to me coming from you. Thank you for finally coming on the show. Thank you for finally asking me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Come back on. What? Okay. One day, okay. One day, come back. One day. On. <laughs> Another five years from now, maybe we'll have you on. We'll see. It's been a pleasure. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Peter. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of The Gotham, formerly IFP. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.